The first one on the ballot is Dan McQueen. Would you come up to the front? Thank you. First of all, I need you to tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we'll open it up for questions. Okay, and thank you, uh, thank everybody for coming right now. This is a very, very important time for us. It's a very important time for us as a city. It's an important time for us as a region. And as I look at the entire uh, coast and the operation that's occurring in the, uh, the coast with technology growth in Brownsville, I think it's critical that we start thinking about what our future is and what our sustainment plan is for the future. My name is Dan McQueen, I'm running for mayor. I'm an aerospace engineer. A lot, of, a lot of you folks have already heard this before. I'm a master at martial arts, uh, naval special operations, rescue swimmer. I've got a master's degree in computer science, a bachelor's degree in uh, aerospace management, bachelor's in electrical engineering. So I'm a pretty technical person. I have a strong management background. I've, uh, as, I've, as I've stated, I've served our country in harm's way. I've been in Afghanistan, I've been in Iraq, I've been in the Persian Gulf, flown through the, the Straits of Hormuz on multiple occasions. So I feel for all of us as a country, and I feel for our soldiers as we're over here and they're over there. I feel for them. And so always make sure that we're supporting our troops because they're paramount. We have issues with our city right now. We have issues with our firefighters not uh, getting along with our council. As I look at our city, our streets are in decay. We can't fully fund our police officers. We can't fully fund our firefighters. We're driving around on fire trucks with only three men. I don't know if any of you have ever held a fire hose before, but if you don't have two people behind you, there's a lot of pressure from, from that hose. And it takes one little slip, and we have a fire fighting team that's down. So safety is paramount to me. And one of the things that I teach throughout the city, and I'm, in, I'm involved greatly. When I got here, I started teaching martial arts at the YMCA. I'm a volunteer. I don't charge anybody. And so I teach the youth. Safety is our number one concern. I, I teach at the YMCA, the Garza Gonzalez uh, Charter School, uh, Parks and Recreation. I teach at Northside Manor, uh, the kids over there. And, and the first thing I teach is safety, the second thing I teach is respect, okay? And so as we move those programs forward in development, we're gonna create a safety net for our city, a safety net for all of us. Second thing I do in this city is I mentor technology, I mentor aerospace. As an aerospace engineer, I've got a team and I just met with them this morning, graduate students from A&M working aerospace projects so that we can develop new products that will help us build industry and technology so that we can pay for all of the decay that we have in the city. Right now we're chasing after problems that were created, not by any leadership, but by an economic dive and when the oil industry left us. If you look around most of our buildings, we're old oil industry buildings. And we're chasing that dream again without a vision of sustainment. And so my vision is that we, be, we become a technological mecca. And this is what I work towards. I work towards mentoring that, developing new products for that, marketing that. I'm working with Elon Musk's team of Tesla so that I can take that propulsion system that they've already worked on and move it into new products. So my vision is that we're gonna create a sustainable economic model for our city to pay for all of those safety nets that we need and that have been decayed for years. My name is Dan McQueen, I'm running for mayor. Look me up on Facebook or my website and I open it up for any questions, thank you. Now, as you can see, you have uh, two mics on each side. So if anybody has any questions for Mr. McQueen as far as the mayor is concerned, this is your time to ask. Any questions out there for Mr. McQueen? Okay, Mr. McQueen, I guess you answered all the questions. Sounds good. Okay, uh, before they go, and I do want to give them this opportunity, uh, make sure that you tell them where they can get a hold of you and how they can get a hold of you if they want to help you campaign. And that's excellent. 
Always go to Facebook because everybody's got a Facebook page. Go to Dan McQueen for Bay on Facebook. Message me. I answer all the messages that come up there. Uh, go to my website, danmcqueen.us. Email me at vote for Dan at danmcqueen.us. Uh, and uh, I'm always available. Thank you. on the ballot is Bob Jones, number two on the ballot, Mr. Jones. And again, uh, don't be shy. You can ask a question. This is a community forum for you to be able to ask the questions of the people. And if you don't ask them, then how do we know that you need answers for things? How are your candidates doing out there? <laughs> I'm Bob Jones. I first came to Texas in 1968. Moved to Corpus Christi in 1991, for 25 years. Served in the grassroots, in the streets, in the community with the people. Boys and Girls Club Board, USO Board. Worked with Mark on UC4 season. He did a four year college here. Um, RTA for eight years. Uh, helped develop and get money from Washington for all those transit centers and things. And the purpose of the transit center was to make shorter rides for people because most of the people actually are going to and from work. Make it close to real time. Um, trustee South Texas Institute for the Art a number of years. And I go on Food Bank Board, USO. Um, also a vice president for two years of United Way, Government Services. Was uh, nominated uh, by Bush and uh, for the State Veterans Board, because at that time, Carlos Chuan said, no way. After that, Rick Perry came in and appointed me to the uh, Texas Coastal Coordination Council, where I helped oversee the 367-mile coast of Texas, out to three and a half leagues to sea. We uh, helped develop the Coastal Zone Management Plan. I helped with NAERS, all those kind of things. Did it for seven years. In 2009, I was a uh, Appointed chair, Texas State Affordable Housing Corporation Board of Directors. We put a billion dollars into low, low, lower income housing. We also have a Homes for Hero program. And uh, while it includes vets, it includes policemen, firemen, EMS, teachers, educators. We help them get the lowest interest loan, not just first time home buyers, but also second time. Because these individuals are integral to the quality of life in our state. And uh, I'm running for mayor because it's a higher level of service call. Basically, if you want things as they are, to continue with tax and spend, tax and spend, then you'll keep the current administration. If you want a new direction, then you vote for me. I'm Bob Jones. Mr. Jones may not have been here when he told him. I, I want everybody that is not running for office, is not running for office, to stand up. Anyone that is not running for office. So we have a lot of people that are not running for office, okay? Uh, we, we are having this uh, forum televised. Uh, it will be shown in Time Warner, Ronda, and AT&T Cable. So one person just asked me, I want to ask questions, but I want to ask questions of all of the people that are there. I'm giving you the opportunity to ask the candidates as they come up. But if you feel you have to ask a question of all of them, then I'm going to let you do that at the very end of the presentation. Because if you want that question answered by all of the candidates, then you might want to come up after each of them have spoken. But right now, does anyone have any questions in particular about Mr. Jones? Okay? Mr. Hassel, would you please come up to the mic? I am running for a uh, for board. Uh, does that matter? No. <laughs> You're, you're voting in a separate election. <laughs> I'm just kind of curious about uh, Mr. Jones here. He's a, being, he's a brother, a uh, veteran brother, and uh, I've seen him all over the place. I've seen him in uh, various um, communities. Uh, he's very exposed. He's very sensitive to the needs. And now, before I ask you, uh, you asked the question, how y'all doing? I thought it's doing all okay. <laughs> the, the question I have for you, what distinguishes you from the rest of the candidates? Uh, I know and I've dealt with you before as far as being sensitive to us little people. Uh, some of us have, fall, have fallen down and you've been there to pick us up. Uh, and again, what distinguishes you from the rest of the candidates? Thank you. Mr. Jones, if you would come over here. Uh, well, I can't say everything with the rest of the candidates because some of these individuals I've just met 
Um, but I think what distinguishes me is that I am basically running as the voice of the people. It's as simple as that. The people feel they have no voice. They think they're not listened to. They think the city hall doesn't include them in the decisions that they make. We live in a representative republic. It's not a democracy, it's a representative republic. The people are the citizen rulers of the nation, of the state, of the city. And when they elect an individual, they're not electing somebody to rule over them, boss them, dictate to them. What they are asking is find out what we want, what we feel that we need, and be our voice. Be our voice in Washington, be our voice at the State House, be our voice on the Commissioner's Court, and be our voice on City Council. And the worst thing that can happen to this community is if the people lose confidence in local government and start voting down all kind of bonds and proposals, good and bad, whatever, we will stagnate as a community in the midst of an economic oil generated boom. And that's why I'm running. Anyone else have any questions for us, Jack? Okay, thank you very much. Third on the ballot is our incumbent mayor, Nelda Martini. Thank you, and I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to LULAC and to the Mothers and Grandmothers organization. I have absolutely enjoyed being your mayor for the last couple of years in my first term, but I think also having the public service experience I've had not only as an advocate before I was your city councilwoman at large for six and a half years, but being born and raised in Corpus Christi, I think it's one of the biggest blessings that you can have. I mean, this is a community-oriented city that you can really make a difference if you get involved. You can leave your fingerprint. And what I have seen that has happened in this community is that those things that we're most proud of that have made a positive difference for all of our families and generations to come have come from the majority of volunteerism and public service. So where I come from in my family, and I'm happy to say that I have family here with me this weekend, I have my sister Cindy Vasquez from California and Joanna uh, Vasquez from San Antonio. They marry brothers, can you believe that? Anyway. <laughs> But uh, with all that said, I, um, um, it's been an honor and a privilege to be your mayor. And what we have uh, figured out uh, with the, certainly our council members that I'm very, very proud to serve with is that we have been your voice and certainly listened to everything that you have stated. You said we've got to take care of this 30-year-old problem, have the political courage, have the political will to deal with the streets problem. We were the first to come up with a comprehensive streets plan not only to have something to deal with the maintenance side, but also to deal with the street standards and the metrics to no longer have those contractors that come in and build any type of work that is shoddy work. There had to be some consequences as far as for how they built these streets, so we have codified that and made that an ordinance. And so now that we have the street maintenance program and we're finally dealing with something, because if we didn't have the street maintenance program that we put together, then it was going to cost all of our taxpayers and all of your grandchildren a lot more. So you either pay now or you pay a lot more later. So I'm very proud of the teamwork that we did in finally dealing with this 30 year old problem. We were no longer going to kick that can down the road. Also, we had a crisis in our water. And we dealt with Mary Roads Phase 2, put that into completion, and that construction has started. Otherwise, the water planners told us that we were going to run out of water in 2017. So we dealt with that. We also have incredible efficiencies that we've addressed. And we have totally reorganized uh, the utilities department, going from seven into three in the public works, saving you money, taking underperforming uh, city operations and privatizing some of those with our single stream recycling, also with our golf courses, and taking some of those out of the red into the black. It's all about being good stewards of your financial taxpayer money every single day. We take it very, very seriously. And our vision also is to diversify our economy. It's what you do with the money now that we're able to invest in so many of the initiatives that we were behind on. Now we're finally able to put more money into our parks and to beautify our city. We're able to have upgraded technology systems that were so antiquated now that we're going to have operational efficiencies saving you, your taxpayer money. 
Now we're going to be able to invest finally in the public safety that we needed with our police officers. And I have to give credit to Colleen McIntyre for finding that in a sustainable fund in our crime control district. And it's not just a one time 14 officers, 13 officers, I say 14, uh, that we pay one time and then wonder about what we're going to do for the next uh, legislative session. I mean, excuse me, the next budget year, but it's something that we made sure that was going to be sustainable and it wasn't going to be a band aid. So, everything that we're dealing with, we are dealing with real problems, dealing with real solutions, and you are not going to make a lot of people happy, but I'm not in this to be popular. I'm in this to represent you, to do right by you, by every single penny that comes into that city taxpayer coffer. And when things start to get better, this is the time also when we begin to put money into our reserves. It is so critical that we have those funds ready when we're going to have a rainy day because I'll tell you, when we had to deal with the streets and we had some one-time expenditures regarding uh, initiatives with our streets, it was raining. And we're also finally dealing with the infrastructure on the stormwater. We're also dealing with some of our plants, some huge capital improvement programs that we're taking the bull by the horns. So it has been a pleasure, and I've been delighted that I have had my career here in Corpus Christi. Uh, I have owned and grown four businesses. I've sold two of them. Thank you, dear Lord, for that. Thank you for my family. Thank you for giving me the honor and privilege of being your mayor. I absolutely love my job, and I ask for your vote for my re-election. God bless you, and thank you. questions for the mayor at this time? Any questions from the audience? Mr. Hassel, please come up. Nobody has questions. Mr. Hassel, thank you because I know I can count on you to be forward. Honorable Mayor, uh, just one question. Uh, as you know, the uh, South Side is, is, is increasing and it's building and uh, you know, it's growing uh, proportion. Uh, the only question I have to for you, and if you've responded to this, my apologies. I, I haven't no, heard have a have response. Questions. Uh, what happened to the uh, new fire station? Thank you. When we have a bond election, what that does is that gives us the authority should it come out to be a need. And we had an updated study regarding the needs within the fire department. And we have been told by our city managers and those experts that are a lot smarter than us in identifying where we have those needs that today is not the day that we have that fire station need. However, it's my understanding that it still will happen. It's, uh, the, the question is when, and at the appropriate time, that certainly will happen. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Any other questions directly for the mayor? If not, at the end, we're going to let you ask questions of all of them. And our last candidate coming up, Mr. McQueen, who is running for mayor, and he's fourth on the ballot, right? Thank you all. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the invite. I am Lee McGinnis. I am fourth on the ballot. I am born in Spain, but raised in Corpus Christi. I'm the son of two military personnel, two veterans. They were active duty in Spain. Uh, my older sister and I were born there. My younger sister, who is here today, was born here in Corpus Christi. We have lived here for 30, almost 34 years now. Grew up in Flower Bluff, graduated from Flower Bluff High School in 1998. Uh, I have worked in Corpus Christi and around Corpus Christi my entire life. I've done everything from ranch hand work out on Chapman Ranch, detailing sailboats down in the marina, I'm a corrections officer for five years for Randis County. Uh, it's, I went back to school in January to study business. I love Corpus Christi. When I was growing up, Corpus Christi was referred to as a sparkling city by the sea, or the jewel on the Texas Riviera. Those are two terms you never hear when referencing Corpus Christi these days, unless it's a marketing ploy by the city. The trust is already gone. That's apparent by the 24 people running for nine positions on our city government. People do not trust the city council to do what they want. There is a time and a place for everything to get done. The mayor just said that the fire station will get built. I hope it gets built faster than the fire station on Rod Field. It took 13 years after it was approved in a bond election. A bond election is the will of the people. It is not the place of our city manager to dictate when it gets done. It's 
called a council manager form of government for a reason. The council sends the policy to the manager. It's the manager's job, job to carry that out and not second guess the council. The study the city manager did was one of four studies that was done that said we needed it. I would much rather depend on the people that ride those fire trucks and work in my community to tell me what they need than a consultant that's hired by the city. They know what they need. They are the guys on the trucks. They are the bros with the hoses. And it's just something that they need to be talked to about. We don't have a city council at this point that seems to listen to what people say. You are invested in this community. You are invested in this government. Whenever you have something to say, whether you have the paper behind your name that says that I can take a test, I can regurgitate knowledge, whether you've got that piece of paper behind your name or not, you are a stakeholder in this city. You are not a silent partner. You are invested either in business, family, time. This is your city. This is your community. And the sooner we get a city government in there that recognizes that and is not afraid to ask why, that is not afraid to ask the people that actually work in this community what they need, that's, then our city will move forward. I don't want to invest heavily in technology. I'll tell you that right now. What I say might not make you happy. It won't make you happy. We need to go back to where our city was on a personal level before we start leaving our city behind. Technology is great, but technology is a young man's game. It's not for everybody. You, you start putting too much emphasis on technology, you're gonna leave a lot of people behind. This is a working community. We are refiners, we are agriculture, we are city workers, we are blue collar, not white collar, and sometimes we are black collar. It's not a time to just start bringing in educated people, because you start building technology, that's great, but you're not gonna have a workforce already here. You're not creating a job for somebody here today that is plumbing. They, everybody has specialized knowledge, specialized knowledge in what they do. Our city council can't build a house, so I depend on my city council to ask somebody who's a contractor, all right, lay this out for me. Our city council can't rough in their plumbing, so I expect them to ask an engineer or contractor that's actually done that. I would prefer a master plumber. All right, how do I do this? But our city council will not ask a guy on a fire truck, okay, what do I need? They'll go to a consultant. That's wrong. The men and women that serve this community are being left behind. And it's not just public safety. Public safety is, is an issue all over. I have a personal bone to pick with the city detention center. I don't like the city detention center. It's a $1.25 million liability on this city. It's not that it doesn't serve a purpose, but the purpose it serves is a duplicate purpose of what our city, of what our county facility serves. If you have a class B misdemeanor or above, you're automatically going to the county jail, so why am I paying for a city detention center when they're already going to the county jail? It's only a 13 hour hold facility. They don't have to report their escapes. They don't have to be inspected by the state of Texas for jail standards. It's in a retrofitted building. It's a business complex, for crying out loud. It's not a jail. Jails are built for a reason, and they are built to standard and code for a reason. It does not involve $65,000 for new cell doors. It is in a retrofitted building. So I want to go back. Take a couple steps back, because we're running too fast. We're running too close to the edge of that cliff. And if all we're looking at is technology, 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 and if we're just trying to go forward, 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 I'm not saying stop. I'm saying slow down. You don't slam on the brakes in a semi-truck in the middle of the freeway, you're gonna cause a bigger accident. You need to control that, your speed, and just pull over to the side of the road and allow things to catch up. And that's, that's my vision. I'm Lee McGinnis, a number four. Any questions for Mr. McGinnis? Uh, I want to take a few minutes because I promised you you could ask a question of all of them so they could answer because I've requested, someone requested that. Mr. McGinnis, any questions for him? No? 
Okay, then uh, right now I'm going to take just a few minutes to let you uh, know that the person that is responsible for this forum, really, and is the head of our LULAC Council Number One, the founding chapter that was founded here in Corpus Christi. We have the privilege of Corpus being the birthplace of a lot of things, but the proudest thing I'm, I'm proud of is being a member of Council One. Our president, Dr. Nick Adami. and then we'll get back to the merit world candidates. You know, I don't know if I'm preaching to the choir here. Do I see all candidates? Uh, even if we have community, you know, the important thing is, is what? It's your right to know what is going on with the candidates. That's why the questions will be directed from you, the community, straight toward the candidates. We're not going to screen the questions. We're just going to go ahead and let you ask the questions. Although, we do have a referee in case there's a fight. Okay, so be nice if you're going to ask your questions. Welcome. Thank you. And just to make it an equal playing field, I'm not asking any questions, okay? So, people, you're safe. Uh, but we had somebody, a gentleman that wanted to ask a question of all the candidates. Will you please come up and ask your question, sir? Hopefully it's a very simple, easy to answer question, but it's not. Over the last few months, the city and the fire department, or the fire association, have had some disagreements, and there's been a lot of trust issues involved with that. How, if you're elected or re-elected, will you deal with regaining the trust of your fire department? I think that's an outstanding question. I think I think it's very important to understand that if you don't trust the people that are representing you, that we have a broken system, okay? Now, what I will specifically do, and, and this is what I've offered, is all of my integrity that I have. Now, I've already created dialogue with the firefighters, and they know where I come from. I've been in harm's way. I've been on the battlefront, and I know what it's like when you're in a situation and you don't trust the guy next to you or the gal next to you. This is a... This is something that we've got to change here. We're not going to get past this until we can communicate and until we understand that each and every one of us are just one in a team for this city. The firefighters or the city government, neither one of those two probably want to be in a conflict. And I believe that as we build and utilize our integrity and work for a mutual goal, we're going to be able to achieve that. Our biggest issue right now, and I'll point to it again, it's that we don't have the finances for all of our safety nets. This is what we have to focus on, is building that revenue stream so that we can ensure that we have all the finances required for each of us to do our operation most effectively. I hope I've answered that question. Thank you. Obviously, there's always gonna be a certain amount of conflict in labor negotiations, um, and that's to be expected. If the firemen have lost their trust, then it's an issue that's a little bit important because they have to serve the city. Um, we, or at least I, only from the outside in, I'm not privy to the intricacies of the negotiation for everybody. It's not gonna be fair for the city, it's not gonna be fair for the firefighters, nobody's gonna get 100% of what they want. However, when the egos are involved, you end up in litigation. You end up with firefighters, citizen firefighters, that are working because they love to work in our city. They don't have to work in our city. They can go elsewhere. They can go elsewhere and get treated better. They love our city. They are citizens. They are firefighters. And we need to get them back to the table, and we need to take a good, hard look in the last 10 years, their pay has increased just roughly about 12%. We have a city manager who's got a 12% pay raise after being here for three years. You can't use one argument for one person and the other, and turn around and say that argument is not, is not valid for everybody else. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. If you're willing to bring one person in the city government up to the average of the nation or average of the state, then you should be able to you know, seriously 
take a look at bringing everybody up closer to the average. Thank you. Now, I'm going to give time to the mayor of Stanton. It's one more question for all of them, if anyone has one. Sir. Hi, my name is John Stafford, and my question comes down to annexation of Chapman Ranch. I support <coughs> clean energy. I support wind farm out there. And I see the annexation of Chapman Ranch as trying to short circuit the wind farm down there. If we were annexing property just outside the current city limits <coughs> on Staples or along Crosstown near Weber uh, and expanding the city with close in annexation properties that were easy to add services to, that would make sense to me. But annexing something that's so far away as Chapman Ranch that it's going to stress our city budget at a time when we don't have the budget, at a time where I would prefer that that money is actually repairing my roads, is a problem to me. So I ask for all the challengers, where do you stand on the Chapman Ranch annexation? John, I appreciate that question because that's a very, that's a very important question. It's a, it's a real management question. The question that you have to ask yourself right now is, are we specifically in a position to where we can afford growth in an area with a city that has massive decay of over 50% of our streets? The cost of $13 million just to connect us to that doesn't include the cost of all of the services firefighter services, police services, and all of these safety nets that we have already spoke of as being an issue with our entire city. They're an issue with our firefighters today. They will be an issue in, this, in the spring when we go to negotiate the contract with the police department. This is gonna continue on until we figure out that we are going the wrong way. And I don't care if you use the analogy of putting the brakes on with an 18-wheeler on a highway, when you're going the wrong way, it's time to turn around. Annexation of area that we can't afford right now in a city that can't pay for what we already have. Ask yourself this, why do we have to do it today? That's what you've got to ask. Thank you. I've already gone on record as being for infill. It is always more economically feasible to deal with redevelopment of existing infrastructure, in my opinion. But again, the people don't really know what's going on in terms of the annexation. I'm talking about the average person. We can't talk about it. We don't know whether they were trying to annex or intended to annex because they wanted to prevent individuals from building windmills on their private property. We don't know whether the annexation is intended to include it so that they can tax the windmills if the windmills are already built. We don't know. All we do know is, is that right now, the big issue is that people are saying, you have these wants, but we have our needs. People come here and they build their homes and, and they buy a home and they get married and they work 40, 50, 60 years and they pay taxes and they pay utilities and they do it over and over, 40, 50, 60 years, and then they retire. And then they hear the, 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 some bond money was misapplied. Then they hear that uh, the streets were neglected with the money that they voted for. And then they hear that their taxes that they pay is not going to fix theirs. And then they hear that the street fee, street user tax fee, which incidentally, the street user fee, in my opinion, makes Corpus Christi a giant toll road, but eh, that's just me. But on the other hand, they don't feel that they need to take care of. And this issue, regardless of what the underlying reasons are by the council and the staff, is viewed as, once again, your wants versus the community's need. And that's where the issue comes down. I always say take care and do what we have, what we have first before you extend, because you're losing the public confidence and the public trust. Dealing with wants instead of needs and not fully inform the community of what it's all about. Annexation in the South Side is something that we're looking at every single facet regarding <coughs> safety, 
We also have the issue that I talked to Carrie Robertson about last night uh, extensively, and there are several details that we have not been able to share because we are in negotiations and there's proprietary information. But this is all about the decision is going to pay for itself should we move in that direction. We're also concerned about the broadcasters. Every single one of the broadcasters that have spoken, I have so much respect and certainly regarding their intelligence, but we also have the question of someone coming forward to find out, are those windmills, as they have been proven, they've been proven in San Diego also, they've been proven in many other areas, that they actually block the radar from those signals from all the broadcasters to communicate to you regarding safety issues. So if this is going to affect any part of those that I serve regarding information to you on a hurricane, on a tropical storm, or whether there's an issue in industry, or if there's some type of flooding, anything that has to happen related to an emergency that affects your family safety, I'm going to make sure that that is going to protect you and that we don't have any type of prohibitive or encumbrance to protect communications out on all points of the compass to the city. We don't have that information yet. We're going to get an update on the negotiations. It's real important that you have all the facts and all the details of those experts that are going to bring that to the table before we make a final decision. And part of that process will be continuing at our next city council meeting, but we take this very seriously and should it be annexed. Also the projections as far as with income and additional revenues does exceed the cost of infrastructure that would be needed to be put in. So thank you very much for a good question. And um, we stand ready as far as to take all the information where we can make educated decisions. Thank you. We, need, we can do what we need to do with infill. We can develop our city. Work on what we have, not what we desire. Uh, annexation out to Chapman Ranch, in all actuality, speaking with the firefighters, speaking with public safety, at the point we do that, you're going to need two new fire stations, not just one. Because the one fire station that is already behind is to serve an existing need. You annex out the Chapman Ranch, you have to get a fire station to deal with that. So that's two fire stations. You're going to need more firefighters. But I think developers right now, they can build out there right all they want. I think they're kind of happy they're not paying city taxes while they're building out there all they're dealing with is county development can happen out there the only difference is our city's not putting their hand in the pocket of developers so they're able to build where they want right now without having to pay our city and so at this time at this time annexation is the wrong thing for the city we need to deal with what we have before we start going for what we want